Good day, everyone, and welcome to another Live with Kevin. I'm so glad to be with you on a Thursday afternoon in Indianapolis, Indiana. And if you're with us here live, I hope that the first thing that you will do is go into the comments in whatever platform you're in and say hello and tell us where you're from. If you're watching later, that really won't matter quite as much. Uh, but certainly if you're here with us live, we'd love for you to do that. So we know who is here and where you're located. And then that's just a way to get you thinking about being an active participant in this process. So, you know, if if you and I and our guest were sitting around a table having a conversation, you would participate. You wouldn't just sit on your hands, right? You'd participate. If you had a question, you'd ask it. If you had a comment, you'd share it. If you had an idea, you'd offer it. And so when you do those things here now, virtually, uh, we'll have a better conversation. Eventually, this will be a better podcast. And you'll probably get your questions answered. So everybody wins, right? Not only that, uh, doing that just will create a better situation for everyone. So uh, if you love what you're about to experience, and I promise you that you will, you will, and you like this idea of interacting with, having a chance to interact with and learn from thought leaders, then I hope that you will consider joining us for Virtual Leader Con. It's in just a couple of weeks. And you can learn more about Virtual Leader Con here at virtualleadercon.com, where for two days, I'll be joined in a different platform than this, but I'll be joined with leaders like you from around the world and 12 thought leaders to talk about leadership, key ideas. Leave, you will leave with insights, inspiration, and lots more. It's completely free to join us live. Hope you'll do that. Go, go learn more at Virtual Leader Con. Dot com. Now, I mentioned a second ago that this is actually a podcast, and it will be. Um, and But when it becomes an actual podcast, it won't have had any of the stuff I just said. It will start with the podcast intro, which will start in three, two, one. One could argue that communication in all of its forms is the single most important leadership skill. And even if you don't believe it's number one, you'd surely say it's in the top five. Today, we're talking about leadership conversations, a special kind of communication, conversations as a way to lead change and lead your team. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively and make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you're listening to this podcast, in the future, you could join us live. We'd love for you to do that. You can find out when the live episodes are happening and how to get involved by joining either our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to uh, remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkable dot, excuse me, remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. And today's episode is brought to you by our latest book, The Long Distance Team, Designing a Team for Everyone's success. You can learn more by going to longdistanceteambook.com. At longdistanceteambook.com, you can get a free excerpt, learn more, and I hope you'll do that. And now it's time for me to bring in our guest. Here she is. Whoops. There she was. There she is. And let me introduce our guest. Her name is Rose Foss, and we will get started. Rose is the founder and chair of Foss Forward Consulting Group, a leading Edge Business Transformation Boutique. She works with executive teams from Fortune 500 companies. Rose is a frequently invited to speak at private and public sector events. She's been a guest on CNBC and is quoted in several best-selling business books. She's also the author of The Chocolate Conversation, Lead Bittersweet Change, Transform Your Business, and her new book, The Leadership Conversation, Make Bold Change One Conversation at a Time. She's listed in Forbes 2012 uh, as a top 10 woman in business of business leaders in New York. And her company has been a part of the Inc. 500 and 5,000 for three consecutive years. She has a bachelor's from Boston's University School of Management and has completed the advanced executive studies program at Harvard. She is our guest here today. We are so excited to have you. Rose, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I look forward to the conversation. So let's see. We've got some. We've got some folks. We've got some folks from. I think that's your hometown. Yeah. Uh, we've got Pittsburgh. We got more people from Pelham. We've got people from. Let's see. South Florida, 
and lots more. We're glad you're all here. So um, I, I want to just start, Rose, by having you tell us a little bit about your journey. I'm guessing, I often say this to people, I'm guessing when you were five, you didn't say, I want to be an author and consultant. So like, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the journey that leads you to this point. You know, it's funny. I'll open up with a signature story that would sum it all up. I grew up as a young Italian uh, girl, Italian-American girl. Um, my dad had been a World War II Marine um, and was conversant in all the Romance languages. And he also was a published poet, which is unusual. Uh, a very dichotomous kind of personality. He was a Gemini. Uh, but we lived in a four flat house. And uh, I went to school with a group of uh, Italian-American girls. And Annette Punicello uh, was one of the older girls. And I will date myself, ladies and gentlemen, but Kevin will know who she is. Um, she, was a very <laughs> popular, she was a very popular teenage uh, heartthrob for many men during those days, many young boys during those days. But we were a group of girls who were very jealous of the fact that uh, Annette had made it to Hollywood and East Utica is the dregs of the winter that lasts forever in upstate New York. Um, so at five, I was probably thinking I'd love to be a movie star, you know, somebody special. But this was when I was about nine years old and I'm walking home and it's finally a spring day and it's not easy to come across those. And I arrive at my house and I'm very depressed because Annette Punicello, who's much older than us, but has been discovered by Disney and is going to Hollywood. And my dad is plucking dandelions out of the front lawn. And now I'm speaking to both the Marine and the philosopher and I'm walking by and he's like, Rose. And I said, yes, dad. And he said, uh, what do you see? And I thought, oh no, I don't wanna have this conversation. I'm very, very tired and it's Friday and I'm depressed. And so I said, uh, I see a dandelion, Dad. Um, and he smiled and he said, no, honey, tell me what you really see. Look, look broader, look deeper. I said, uh, I don't know, Dad, what do you see? Uh, I had become the queen of the rhetorical responses at a young age. And he said, Rose, I see the end of a very long winter, the dawn of a new spring, the beautiful expression of this wonderful flower that introduces us to spring, I see lovers walking hand in hand, exchanging these in silent I love yous. I see children plucking them out of the ground and bringing them to their moms to be put in juice glasses and set on the window sills in their kitchens. And I looked at him and I said, you see a lot, dad. He said, soon Rose, the prettier flowers are gonna come along. The tulips, the daffodils, the irises, and yes, darling, even the roses. And I, like many other homeowners, will start ripping the dandelion out of the lawn, going to the nurseries, getting the chem chemicals to burn it out. This now beautiful expression of spring becomes a weed and a distortion to the lawn. But the beauty of the dandelion is not in its fleeting glory when it opens up its flower and introduces us to spring. Um, it's in its root because all of us who have ever played around with dandelions know that they fight to come back and they come back double fold because the dandelion is resilient. Your mother and I, we've named you Rose, but roses are fragile. In your heart, you need to be a dandelion. Um, and I spent the next several minutes crying in the arms of the Marine and the philosopher. And for whatever reason, I felt better and I took my rightful place among the weeds. And most of my journey has been about being resilient. And so uh, we open, um, perhaps appropriately, this conversation about leadership conversations uh, in a conversation between Rose and her father. So thanks for sharing that. So as we dive in, and we said we were going to talk about your new book, The Leadership Conversation. Here it is, everybody. Thank you. Um, Thank and so why... Why conversations? Why leadership conversations? Why the focus on that, Rose? It, for many years, Kevin, having worked at, in startups as an entrepreneur, having gone through really rigorous corporate training, 
uh, with Fortune 100s and being even in the C-suite. The one thing that I thought was always lacking was the ability to have an effective conversation. And, and I always felt that leadership actually happened in the conversation. It wasn't heads down when you were doing reporting or you were standing up necessarily and telling people what you wanted them to do. It really happened in the way in which people interacted with their leaders, understanding what it was they were meant to be doing and giving it purpose and meaning so that people really felt like one, they were being listened to and two, they were listening to you. Um, I told you my dad was conversant in all the romance languages. There was a reason for that. He wanted people to know that he was listening. He used to say to me, if you do anything right in this world, Rose, just listen. Um, and I learned that at a young age. So later, as I got further and further into my career, I began to see the lack of what I considered to be really worthwhile and good conversations. And I also later on remembered saying to someone, when you become a leader, the casual conversation can't happen anymore. You can't do that fly by in the hall. You're responsible for what you say. Um, you've got to think about things and it doesn't mean you can't be informal. You just can't be casual, offhanded. Um, and little by little by little, um, in the first book, The Chocolate Conversation, I got that inspiration from going to a chocolate party, bring your own chocolate in college. And uh, I began to see how uniquely different people think about simple concepts. And this was chocolate. And we were having all kinds of debate. So I'll pause there um, to just give you an opportunity to you know, follow up with me. But that's basically why I have always felt very strongly um, about this concept of conversation. So the new book is about this idea of leadership conversations. And, and I said it in the opening, you just said it again, that you wrote this other book called Chocolate Conversations. And you talk about it a little bit in the new book. And, yes, I do. And so we don't need to hear the whole story, but I think it's important to recognize the idea that uh, there's when we're having chocolate conversations uh, using your language and we all have a lot of them. There's something missing that makes them chocolate conversations. Yeah. So what is it that's missing in our conversations that you would make them what you would call a chocolate conversation? Yeah. So you see it all the time. You see it on the public stage today. Um, you see it on the news. People have different points of view. Years ago, you were allowed to have a different point of view. Today, if your point of view doesn't match with someone else's, um, it almost becomes cult-like in the way that people start shutting down conversations and not allowing the natural discourse or debate to take place. Um, so this chocolate party really taught me something. I realized at a worldview level, we could all love chocolate. But when we got to our standard as to what that looked like, we had very different points of view. So there were people that, you know, wanted to talk about the percentage of Keiko and others that were like, just give me a, you know, a pack of M&Ms, I'll be very happy. Um, I went to an all company meeting in corporate uh, and the strategy was being laid out there and everybody walked out with a very different interpretation. The CEO got very upset as he started to see these interpretations play out in actual planning and action, brought everybody back um, and said, you know, what don't you get? And <laughs> It's his job to make us get it, but I didn't want to get into that. Uh, long and short of it was, I said to myself, ha, ah, this is a chocolate conversation. And that became the impetus for the book because I said to myself, um, this would be a good metaphor for when people are thinking they're on the same page, but they're talking past one another. And three layers to that chocolate conversation were worldview which is usually invisible. It's how you've been raised. It's the people you hang out with. It's your point of view. Um, the standard is kind of the expectation you have for others, for yourself and others. It's the bar that you set. Um, and then concern, which is the third layer of the chocolate cake, is that whole feeling of, well, if Kevin doesn't agree with me and he has a different standard than I do, uh, well, then, you know, I have a concern 
Um, and interestingly enough, before this podcast took place and I got on early and you said that usually doesn't happen. And I was raised that if you were on time, you were late. So I had the Marine Corps father up at 0600 ready for company. So here I was with Kevin and I could tell there was an appreciation for that. And I had an appreciation for you because I came on not expecting you to be on and you were on too. And so we had a common world here and a common standard. Um, that doesn't happen often. And we have to be prepared that if someone else has an alternative or different point of view, that doesn't mean they're wrong. <laughs> um, and that's the key. To that point, you talk about constructive dissent. Yes. Versus yes. destructive dissent. Yes. We don't have to talk about destructive dissent because we all know what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, but, but what are the Since, what are a couple of ideas to help us with this idea of constructive? Yeah, I think uh, you know I was watching Mona Lisa smile uh, once again, uh, one of the movies that I really enjoy, and uh, she is the the main actress in the movie is standing there in showing a Jackson Pollock painting in the 1950s to an art class of Wesleyan women. And they're like, what? And she said, I'm not asking you to like it. Just consider it, just consider it. And I think that's the key. I think we have to consider what another person is saying. They may not, we may not agree. We may come from a very different point of view. I'm, I'm always struck, Kevin, by the fact that the people that re really request a lot of tolerance and want empathy and expect people to be accepting and inclusive can oftentimes be the least tolerant. And that's always shocking to me. It's kind of like, okay, I may not have an ultra conservative point of view, but I need to consider it. Uh, I may not have an ultra liberal point of view, but I need to consider it. That's all I'm saying. I just think the way you can have a constructive conversation is to allow the other person's point of view to exist. You don't have to agree with it. Yep. So it's so it's one thing uh, for us to work on that ourselves. It's another thing for us as a leader to be trying to create that as a standard, to try to create that as an expectation, to try to create that as a culture on our team. So what advice would you have if if we're sitting here nodding our heads saying, "Yeah, I want to get." I want to get better at that, but I want my team to get better at that. What's your advice to help us do that? Yeah, I, I once went to an offsite um, with a gentleman that had years and years and years of experience as a philosopher. And he asked us all to bring a piece of music. And uh, this was a very, very energized group. And we were polarized with one another, very different, two very different corporate cultures coming together in sort of an acquisition, it was not working. I thought it was, hey, why is he asking us to bring music? Um, so we played our music and we were supposed to say what it meant to us. Um, and I can't tell you, Kevin, but I, it was game changing. Um, I played Ave Maria because it reminded me of my grandfather who was Italian immigrant. And it was just beautifully done by Pavarotti and I played it and I said, it just reminds me of home, of being, with my grandfather uh, and people started opening up in different ways and I think we have to try to break down the barriers that exist and by giving something to somebody that is totally outside of the typical business conversation and ask them to do something as simple as bring a piece of music and tell people why you like it one of the other things that we've done at fast forward that I think is an interesting thing is we ask people to introduce somebody um, and talk about what stands out for them in that person and, um, and what they think they could learn from them. Uh, and we shake up the names in a, in a hat and you just pick out a name and I get Kevin. Mm -hmm. And I may not know you all that well, but I'm able to do something. I think the important thing for all leaders to do with their teams is to create a foundation for listening that maybe is right, not directly in the mouth of the beast, but a little bit outside the icebreaker that then allows people to see people as human beings before they see them as different points of view. Um, I love that. 
I, I do love that a lot. I, I want to read you something. This is not a test, but it happens to be on page 37 of the book. Uh, and I'm, we, I'm, I'm talking with Rose Foss. If you came in in the middle of this, or you, do, or you lost track of where we are, and we're talking about her new book, The Leadership Conversation. And I'm going to read you a line from the bottom of page 37. And I just want you to comment on it. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it stands on its own. And yet I'd like you to, to, to uh, add to it as you'd like. Speaking naturally and authentically about what you believe in, whether it be a political position, a personal choice, or a business decision, will get the attention of your audience. Yeah. And I think it's about being real. I, the best example I can give of that most recently, um, I never thought about Zelensky. I don't know if you did. I didn't. I didn't even think about him, to tell you the truth. And then when I heard he was a comedian and all that, I thought, that's kind of interesting. Um, and then that moment when uh, he was asked if he would like an escape out of the country and a safe departure. And I thought, what an extraordinary leadership moment. What an authentic, real way of sharing his point of view without being sarcastic, but being slightly humorous and turning around and saying, look, guys, I don't need a ride. Just give me the ammunition that I need to take care of business because this is my country, I'm not leaving. I go first. Um, even if you didn't agree, um, what an extraordinary, real moment that was. I always, I tear up when I think about it because to me, it's like Rosa Parks deciding not to get up off of her seat on the bus. It's those little things that you're sharing your worldview, but in a way that people can hear it because it's so real, or Gandhi standing in front of parliament and they prepare to dislike him and giving him a standing ovation because from the heart, he's sharing something. So I do think when we're a vulnerable and we're compassionate and we're sharing from the heart, that kind of authentic, you can't help but love the person even if you disagree with their point of view. Which takes us back to where we started. And there's so much, there's so much, discussion and effort aimed at uh, D E I B whatever words we want to put in here, right. About, uh, about creating inclusiveness, creating uh, collectiveness, creating belonging, creating the, the chance to learn from and with each other. And yet we can do all of that. We want if we, without doing what you're talking about, Rose, we're never going to get there uh, ultimately. And, uh, and so I really, I really love that. And, and that, that piece that I just read where you talked about being yourself and the examples that you just shared are sort of the opposite of what we often see. And I know yeah. that you see because it's in, it's in the book is the, is the idea of corporate speak. So yeah. if, if there are leaders listening now that have trouble being that real self or are locked into corporate speak because that's what everybody else does. What advice do you have for them there? Yeah. Um, it's hard to unlearn. Uh, and sometimes we bio out of our parents and even our parents can be very formal. Some people come from very formal parents. And so they are taught not to express or show feeling. Um, and I've, I've had people like that work with me and for me, and I've worked for those kind of people. Um, and my heart goes out because it's difficult. But I think if you can find that place where you can identify who you really are, um, you know, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do, but it's so important to be able to find that place where you can hear your own voice, where you can know if you quiet down enough what your gut is telling you. And it takes practice, Kevin. You know, it, it comes relatively easily to me because I grew up in a family where everybody just said whatever they felt like saying. Um, but not everybody has that. And I'm aware of that. And um, it's one of those things that we just have to, we have to get in touch with ourselves. It's a wonderful old poem, The Journey. Uh, and she talks about how I sweep and sweep and sweep and this house is too small for me. And I go out in the wilderness and there's debris all over the place and I in the noise and I'm hearing the melancholy of their cries. 
um, you know, pulling me and pulling at my heartstrings. And then finally things calm down and I hear a voice that sounds strangely familiar to me and it's my voice. Um, and I know the only life I can change. I think that's the most important thing for anybody who's trying to get in touch with their authentic self is to go to wherever you need to go to, to find that still small voice that's talking to you. Um, it's not easy, but it, that's what you need to be able to do. So there's a chapter in the book um, that talks about going there. And uh, we all know this phrase, well, I don't want to go there. And uh, as I was thinking about what all I wanted to talk about in our conversation, I thought, well, we probably ought to go there. Um, and, and so you say that we've got to go to the places that people say we don't, shouldn't go. Yeah. Um, so why do you say that and give us an example? Yeah. So uh, I was working with a woman that I really admire and I'm going to say her name, Leslie Barron. She came out of Xerox, a wonderful woman, brilliant finance person. Anyway, she said to me once, she said, don't go there, Rose. Uh, and I knew that meant that it was undiscussable there. She was worried about me getting in trouble and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, no, we need to go there. We need to have this conversation. We've forgotten our way. We're not taking care of our customers and we got to talk about it. We got to talk about what we're doing here. We were putting a lot of burden on our sales force to do all kinds of things that were creating a lot of customer effort. Um, and so it needed to be discussed and no one wanted to. Um, I think that's true in a lot of places. Uh, you know, I worked with Estee Lauder and they used to say, you know, there's certain things that we just don't talk about. Um, and they're a wonderful company. And yeah, I say I pack my bags and I'm definitely going. Um, I think when it's hard to go there, it's because we don't know how to do it in a respectful way. Uh, so it's not about being snarky or sarcastic or shaking a person down or making them feel less than so that you can be important. Recently, one person that I work with uh, at uh, Fast Forward said to me, I was having a conversation with someone and I said, I cannot shrink to make you feel big. Um, <laughs> And I thought, what a wonderful, wonderful expression. It, it It is about being kind when you're disagreeing with someone and to just say, you know, I have an alternative point of view. I'm a little worried that you're going to be upset with me because I don't totally agree with what's going on. I've done this. Um, but if you don't mind, I'd like to express what I'm feeling and I'd like to at least have you consider what I'm saying and let's talk about it. It's the conversation about the conversation. You almost need permission sometimes to have the conversation with someone. Is it okay if we talk about this? Um, I know it's delicate, I know it's uncomfortable, but I'd like to be able to bring it up. I think we have to do it, Kevin. And I think those are there's respectful ways of doing it. And the thing people worry about the most and the reason they don't wanna go there is they're afraid of something happening that's not gonna be good. I'll lose my job. Somebody will dislike me. I'll break a relationship, whatever it is. Yeah, whether it's the 800-pound gorilla or the elephant or whatever you want to call it, we all have been there where we know we're all tiptoeing around it. And, and, and we sort of know it needs to be talked about. And, you know, as leaders, you said earlier, leaders need to go first. And being willing to do that, but in the ways that you've described in a kind, caring tactful way and and stating up front your intent in relationship to it uh, everybody which i think is a really important piece of that puzzle so so rose before we finish i've got two or three other things that i want to ask you but i guess one more thing is there something we i i didn't ask i mean there's plenty in the book that we could have talked about for sure but is there anything specifically that i didn't ask that you hoped that i would have or something that no, you'd like to talk about that we haven't talked about yet one of the things uh, you've alluded to it all the way through, I talk about a framework inside of this book called Framing Conversations. And it talks about three spheres. You may have read about that, the technical, the social, and the political. And the example I give in the book is a business example that I won't go into now, but you, you guys can all read that at whatever point in time. But it's how do I take my technical expertise, what I know, but put that in a context that others can understand, socialize it in a way that I'm connecting to another human being 
So the technical sphere is what I know. The social is who I know. And am I connecting with who I know? And then what I talk about in the third sphere is the political. And I don't mean it in the way we're seeing it on the public stage today. I mean it in the way it was intended years and years in ancient Rome and all of that, the political, which was how am I positioning things? Not posturing, but how am I positioning things? Because anybody can posture, but am I positioning it in a way that the other person can feel like they're included in the conversation? And those three things are critically important. And so if technical is what I know and social is who I know, then the political is who knows me. And do they know me for the person that I am and they can trust me and I can become an opinion shaper because in the technical sphere, I'm a valued asset. In the social sphere, I'm a valued colleague, but in the political sphere, I'm, an, I'm really a valued opinion maker. People are seeing me as a valued advisor. And I wanna go from just being a valued asset to being a valued advisor. So it's a very important part of the book. And one last piece is the four considerations that I put in there of business. Um, are you relevant? Can you grow? Can you scale? Can you do it productively and profitably? Uh, and a lot of businesses lose their way because they spend all their time on the growth and the profitability and they lose sight of, am I relevant? Okay. And that was, I put in the book that Stephen Jobs was addicted to relevance. You never knew you needed a thousand songs in your pocket, neither did I. Um, but he started with a concern that people might have. In this case, visual voicemail. Gee, can, would people like to be able to see what it was before they listen? Um, then he set a new standard for the industry and he reframed everybody's worldview around things like songs in your pocket, visual voicemail. So those are the kinds of things that I think in the book are little tidbits, little rich things. And it's only because I'm 74 years old and I've been around a long, long time that I've been able to put all this stuff down and it starts to make sense to me. Rose Foss, The Leadership Conversation. Make one, uh, excuse me, make bold change one conversation at a time. Rose, a couple more things I want to ask you before we go. Uh, and one is, uh, what do you do for fun? I am an art person more than I am an athletic person. So I love to go to plays. I love to hear music. I sing a little of the blues, which I enjoy very much. Uh, I do swim. Uh, I like to dance. Um, and uh, I like to hang out with people that aren't in business. Uh, I hang, my best friend is a jazz pianist. I have another friend who's an art historian, um, another friend who's a therapist. Uh, I just, I enjoy being with people that are very engaged in the arts and that's what I do for fun. I change the channel. I read a lot of great novels, old biographies. I so speaking of reading, let's just do that. Give us something. What's, what are you reading right now, Rose? Yeah. To be honest with you, what I'm reading right now is a book called Sobriety. Um, this, I met this woman's dad at, at the pool and uh, she had a big addiction problem. She was uh, in the agency business and she was an agent for the top stars. Um, but as she started to get addicted to drugs and all of that, she lost her way. And uh, she, once she got sober, she realized that it wasn't just about being sober. She had to find her soul. And this book is a wonderful book. It's, I, I sat there with my eyes like this because I never did anything that bad. Um, but when she turns her life around and she started the first recovery agency using Kevin, the same business model that she did when she was an agent for the stars. And it's incredible. I just, so I'm fascinated by it. And that's what I'm, been pondering over these days. We will have a link to soul, soul sobriety in the, in the notes for the show notes, as well as uh, a link to the leadership conversation. Thank you so much. But, but here's the thing where here's a chance. Tell us where we can learn more. Where do you want to point us Rose uh, before we wrap up? Well, certainly you can go to fastforward.com and learn a lot about us, which would be a wonderful uh, place to learn. Also, we have LinkedIn live. We have uh, one of our key partners, Gavin McMahon, who puts a great number of articles out on LinkedIn Live in a thing called forward thinking. Um, 
we have a wonderful group of people that are always active. So join me on LinkedIn. You'll see a lot of what's going on. Join us on our website um, and we'll share a lot about us. And by all means, download the book. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your views on both the chocolate conversation and the leadership conversation. You can get the book specifically by going to leadershipconversationbook.com. Yeah. And yeah. so now before we finish, I have a question for all of you who are with us watching or listening. It's a question I ask every single week and it is this. Now what? What ideas did you take from this time that you will apply? Uh, I have a bunch of notes here. Uh, one of them being about the idea of how do I take better uh, care to listen to the points of views of others. That's just one example of the kinds of things that you heard today. But if you heard them and said, yeah, that's good, and then moved on, this was not nearly as valuable as if you take some action on what you learn. So I hope that you will reflect on what am, what am I going to do with what I just learned? If you do that, it will be far more valuable than if you don't. So uh, Rose told you to connect with her on LinkedIn. I'll ask you to do the same with me. I hope you'll do that. Rose, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to have you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kevin. And everybody, that means we're done, but only for this week. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Make sure that wherever you're listening, that you like us, that you forward it, that you share it. You know what to do and make sure you come back. We'll see you next week.